Hello, today I'm going to be talking about Archimedes' principle. Archimedes' principle states that when a body is totally or partially immersed in a fluid, it experiences an upthrust which is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Now, before I go into the details and explanation of this statement, perhaps I'll give a little bit of historical background first of all. Archimedes, of course, was a very well-known and highly respected engineer, mathematician, astronomer and inventor who lived in the ancient world. He lived about 2,250 years ago. He was born in Syracuse in Sicily and that Sicily was then under Greek rule, in fact. Now, the king, the king of Sicily at that stage, his name was Hieron, and um, Hieron had um, asked his goldsmith to make him a beautiful new crown out of pure gold, and um, Hieron had given this, uh, him a certain uh, weight of gold, it was, let's say, just for argument's sake, it was a kilogram of gold, and he instructed the goldsmith to make him a beautiful crown and to make sure that he uses gold and nothing but gold for this crown. Now, when the crown came back, Hieron looked at this crown and weighed it, and it did indeed weigh a crown because he was always very suspicious, but it did seem to have a slightly different appearance to the gold that he gave him. He, he wasn't quite sure, he couldn't prove it, the, the luster of it just seemed slightly different. And he wanted to find out, it was, he was desperately keen to know whether he had been tricked or not. So he knew about Archimedes, who had, of course, been famous for a variety of inventions in, in, in Sicily. He had, for instance, constructed a ginormous catapult that could hurl huge stones. He had also invented the Archimedes screw, a wonderful irrigation device that was used for hundreds and hundreds of years, for many centuries. So he was renowned for his capacity for original thinking. Archimedes was then summoned to King Heron, who provided the problem. He said, look, I've got this crown. I'm not convinced that it's made of gold. Could you please help me and establish whether this is in fact just made out of gold? Archimedes scratched his head and he said, look, I can't think of an answer for you at the moment, but I'm going to do my best. And he pondered over this problem for quite a long time. And the, the, the main problem was that he could not melt the crown in order to test the, the actual composition of the crown. So he had to use the crown as it was. Now, the story goes, of course, that Archimedes was, was very, very concerned about this and he got into a bath one day and when he got into the bath, the water overflowed, fell over the floor and suddenly Archimedes had a brainwave. He was so delighted with his brainwave that he jumped out of his bath, forgot to dress and ran naked down the streets of Syracuse shouting, Eureka, Eureka, I have discovered it, I have found it. Now that, of course, is the legendary story, and it's been so well documented and so well passed down that people have illustrated it. And I just wanted to show you such an illustration. This was um, from a book which I have here. The illustration was actually uh, made in the year 1547, and on this illustration you will see um, you will see Archimedes sitting in his bathtub, and you will see water having spilled out on the bottom right hand corner you will see the crown which of course I've colored in yellow because just to make it stand out a little better in the illustration. So that you see is the legend which has been handed down. So what is it then that he had discovered? What was this great discovery all about from the water spilling over? Well in essence he had realized that you can measure the volume of an object such as a crown 
by putting it into a liquid and seeing what the volume of the liquid is displaced. So that was how he, that was his great initiative and great inspiration, should I say. Well, then, so how would he have employed this knowledge to find out whether the crown indeed was made of pure gold or not? The argument is as follows, and this is what he did. He decided that if the crown had had some of the gold replaced by a less dense metal, say for instance copper or silver, and the weight had also been made up to the one kilogram, let's say, then the crown would have a larger volume. It would actually take up more space. Allow me to give a very, very simple example. Let's imagine, for instance, that the silver goldsmith had taken out 100 grams of gold and replaced it with 100 grams of silver. Now, the density of gold is 19.3 grams per cc. Let's just call it, for argument's sake, 20 grams per cc. What that means is that 100 grams of gold will have a volume of five centimeters cubed. Density equals mass over volume. So five centimeters cubed would have been the volume occupied by, let's say, a hundred grams of gold. A hundred grams of silver, by contrast, which has a density of 10.5 grams per cc, let's call that 10 just for simplicity, that would have occupied twice the volume, approximately 10 cc, because if the density is 10 grams per cc, to get 100 grams, you need 10 times that much, which is 10 cc's. Now, that difference of volume between 100 grams of gold and 100 grams of silver is therefore five centimeters cubed, which is a noticeable difference. And he could easily have detected such a change with the apparatus which he had. So what Archimedes did is he took his crown, he took, he displaced, he played it, placed it into water, measured exactly the volume of water displaced. And then he took a kilogram of pure gold and he placed that into water and measured that volume which was displaced and do you know what it turned out that the crown indeed had a greater volume which meant without any shadow of doubt that something had been switched around the gold had been replaced by a less dense metal now, when Archimedes reported his scientifically established by experiment findings to King Heron, King Heron was very angry. I would not like to have been the person who wore the shoes of King Heron's goldsmith. Having introduced you then to the historical background of Archimedes' principle, let us now say what it's all about. Well, it's about immersed bodies, as we mentioned initially, and talking about upthrust and weighing. That's the important thing. And the, when, the important point to understand is that when a body is immersed in a fluid, there are two principal forces acting. One is the weight of the body, which we can call the downthrust, and the other is the upthrust provided by the bulk of the fluid. And the pressure in fluids acts in all directions, and that provides the upthrust for the body in the fluid. Now, I'm going to use this idea to make an experiment in which I shall make a determination of the density of the rubber from which these buns are made. Now, I'm going to apply um, uh, Archimedes' principle in order to, uh, to make this calculation. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to find, I've already found out what the weight of this is, by the way. I'm going to, I have to tell you, the weight of these um, the rubber buns is 500 grams. I've already established that. But what I don't know is what the volume of them is. And it's not a volume you can easily measure with a ruler and do multiplications. The dimensions are too complicated. So I'm going to do it by dropping this into a cylinder, a measuring cylinder, which contains exactly 400 centimeters cubed of water. That's the water which is in there at the moment. I'm going to drop 
these bungs in and see how much water they displace. This will be easy to see because the level of the water will go up inside the measuring cylinder. And, and from that, I will be able to see what the volume of this is, and then I will be able to use the straightforward equation, density equals mass over volume. We know the mass is 500, so this will simply give us the volume by displacement. However, there is one further point which I wanted to illustrate to you, and that is that I'm going to use an elastic cord for this purpose. Now today, I'm not going to be using the elastic cord to actually weigh the rubber, but in, when we do scientific experiments for this, we use special weighing machines, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And I'll explain to you why I am not using the rubber cord as a means of weighing. But what I will be doing, I will be measuring the actual extension of the cord when the rubber bungs are suspended in air, and furthermore, when they are suspended in water in here. Because when these rubber bungs are suspended in the water, they will give us a, what we know as an apparent weight, which is in the water. That apparent weight will be caused because the water will be giving up thrust. So I'm going to start off by measuring, I have a ruler here, and I'm going to just measure the unstretched length of rubber. There is a little black mark there, and if I hold it up against here, then you'll see that that is pretty, that black mark is pretty consistent with 130 millimeters, which is 13 centimeters. So that's our initial length of rubber. I'm going to hold the rubber by, um, by the black mark, putting my thumb carefully over there, and now gently lift these, hoping very much that the rubber doesn't actually break. It is being stretched very considerably. Whoa, just look at that. What a colossal extension we have. I am now going to put my ruler very carefully and try to establish the length that we have in the extended position, which represents, uh, which represents um, 500 grams. And there you see that black mark corresponds almost exactly to 730 millimeters, which is 73 centimeters. Now it was 30 initially, so we have an extension of 60 centimeters with a weight of 500 grams. Very gently, we shall now place this into our measuring cylinder with water and observe how the water level rises inside. So there it is, it's now being displaced. The water is being displaced, but instead of flowing out over the edge of a bath, as it was in the case of Aris, um, Archimedes' um, experiment or experience, it has simply, the water has simply gone up inside the measuring cylinder. And if we now look at the level in here, we can see it's pretty close to 770 centimeters cubed. Now, what this tells us is that the volume of the, of the rubber bung is the difference between 770, which is what we have now, and 400, which is what we have before. And that, of course, is 370 centimeters cubed. So the volume of the rubber is 370. Its weight was 500 grams. So we then put that into the equation. Density equals mass over volume. Now the mass in this case exactly equals the weight, which is 500. 500 divided by 370, that gives us an answer of approximately 1.35. So we have therefore determined, using Archimedes' principle, the weight or the density of our rubber. But now let us look at the extension on our piece of tubing, on our piece of elastic cord, should I say. And if I now place my ruler very carefully and try and get it on to have it suspended, obviously, I have to have it suspended, and we put it on there, then we see that the reading which we are having now is pretty care pretty exactly on 270 millimeters, which is 27 centimeters. Now that 27 centimeters represents the apparent weight of the, of the rubber. That means the weight of the rubber 
including the upthrust, upthrust provided by the water. So this apparent weight we can calculate, of course, because we already know the, then the, the weight to go in was 500 grams, and we know that the weight in, or in here must therefore be 500, take away 370. Now, why is that? Well, because the density of water is one gram per centimeter cube. And therefore, if this has displaced 370 centimeters cubed of water, it will have also displaced 370 grams of water. So therefore, the net down thrust on this is 500 take away 370, which is 130 grams. So what we have now got here, we have got an extension of our rubber of 14 centimeters from 13 to 27, which has been caused by 130 grams weight. I'm going to now take this out and explain to you why now we have not been able to use the rubber as a means of measuring the weight of the buns. Here we go, I'm just taking it out very gently just to make sure that the cord doesn't accidentally slip out or break. The reason why we can't use these extensions on the rubber is because rubber does not obey Hooke's law. So what is Hooke's law, can I tell you? Well, you see, Hooke's law was obviously formulated by Robert Hooke, one of the great natural philosophers living in Oxford. He worked at Oxford University during the latter half of the 17th century. And Robert Hooke was very interested in the effect of force on extending springs. He did many experiments. And he found out that if he takes a spring, and I have here, you see, a spring balance. And I can bring it up a little closer to show you there. And what I want you to notice, and this is the important bit, that the graduations on that spring balance, which is calibrated from 0 to 30 pounds weight, are in a linear manner. Every single division is an exact difference between the next division. So we say that there is a level of proportionality. The force applied at the bottom there is exactly proportional to the weight, to the distance which the marker moves as I pull on it. And this, you see, is an application of what is known as Hooke's law. In the middle of the 17th century, Hooke established the fact that the extension produced to a spring, provided it's within its elastic limit, is directly proportional to the force which is applied. He expressed it in Latin, ut tensio sic vis. As is the force, so is the strain. As is the stress, so is the strain. And that is the level, that is exactly proportional. Now that's why in school physics laboratories and in research establishments, spring balances are used to measure weight. Now, the reason why we can't use that, you see, this same principle here, is because this elastical does not follow Hooke's law. It doesn't extend exactly proportionately and in accordance with the force which is applied. When we had 500 grams, the extension was 60 centimeters. When we had 130 grams, the extension was 14 centimeters. Now, that's pretty close, pretty close, because 130 is approximately a quarter of 500, and 16 is approximately a quarter of 60, not quite, because 16, the extension there, four 16s are, uh, four times 16 is um, 56, so that's not quite right. So it's not exactly linear, but nevertheless, um, we, this, this has acted very effectively. I think the main point of showing this actually is the amazing elasticity of rubber. So having finished this demonstration here and having explained to you the, uh, having explained to you the, um, the, I, the way which we could use um, uh, um, uh, uh, Archimedes' principle, I wanted to show you an accurate apparatus which is used for this purpose. And I have this here because I have here a textbook of physics by the, the German physicist 
Ernst Grimsel. This was published in 1932, and it shows you what's known as an hydrostatic balance. Now, the purpose of the hydrostatic balance is to do exactly what I've just done, but you see, it's using a beam balance. There are two ways of measuring down thrust or weight. One of them is to use a spring balance, and the other is to use a beam balance, and this is supremely accurate. And what you'll notice in this diagram here is that when the solid is immersed in a liquid, the liquid is displaced into another vessel. There's a spout on top of the vessel, close to the top of the vessel. Now, that, of course, that type of apparatus is used today in physics laboratories throughout the world, and the way the volume is measured by displacement is by the, the, the it's called a Eureka can, obviously in honor of, 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 um, of Archimedes, who ran down the streets shouting Eureka. Now, the next point I want, so having showed you then how we can measure the density using Archimedes' principle, I'm going to concentrate a little on the word fluid. It says clearly fluid. What is a fluid? Well, a fluid is a substance which has no fixed shape and which can easily be deformed by applying pressure and external pressure on it. That's one way of defining it. But as in a simple, simple manner, we could simply say a fluid is a substance which fills the a container into which it is placed. But, and this is the important bit, there are two types of fluid, you see. Water is obviously one that comes to mind immediately, but there is also another type of fluid, and that is a gas, you see. Now, the air around us is made of a mixture of gases, and that was being investigated by natural philosophers at Oxford University in the middle part of the 17th century, and Robert Hooke was certainly one of those. But the man who is given most credit for investigating the properties of air, the physical properties of air, was Robert Boyle, the great Irish natural philosopher. And Robert Boyle studied um, the, the compressibility of air. He noticed it was compressible. He's established what's known as Boyle's law. Pressure is inversely proportional to volume. But he described air as an elastic fluid. Please watch carefully. I have a gas syringe here. I put my thumb over the end. I'll just put it out a little bit. I actually put my, my hand over the end. And then as I, as I try and move it back Backwards and forwards, you'll notice there is springiness, compressibility. Now that demonstrates the elasticity of air, which Robert Boyle used to talk about. But now you see we are going to take up some water. I have in my beaker here, I have some water. I'm going to take water up here into my syringe like this. And I'm going to show you that this, in contrast to air, is completely incompressible or inelastic. I'm going to turn it upside down just to exclude a bubble of air from there. And now this is filled with water and nothing but water, which is also a fluid. And if I try now, and no matter how hard I try and move my piston in that syringe, there is no way that that is going to move. It feels just like a solid. It's a remarkable feeling. So what I've demonstrated for you here is the incompressibility of water, which is also a fluid. Now, Archimedes' principle applies to both elastic fluids and inelastic fluids, to gases and to liquids. But what's interesting is that we humans, we've exploited these properties of the two types of fluids in two different types of technology. The compressibility of gases has given rise to the technology of pneumatics. And that is using that compressibility. And a simple, a very, very simple example is, for instance, the car tires are filled with air. Why are they filled with air? Because air is compressible. It's elastic. And therefore, you have a gentle ride over when you have a bicycle with tires filled with air or cars, etc. We know the effects of that. Now, the other type of technology, which is the result of the incompressibility of liquids, is called hydraulics. 
pneumatics and hydraulics and hydraulics for instance are widely employed in heavy duty lifting industry where you see these large arms going up and down with lorries which carry things around that is all done by hydraulics you have hydraulic lifting jacks for lifting cars and lorries and things and you have hydraulic braking systems and the way they operate the reason why all these things can operate is because you apply a force at one end and that force is transmitted with no no loss whatsoever 100 percent efficiency right through to the other end because there is no compressibility possible i am now going to demonstrate for you therefore the archimedes principle using elastic fluids and the elastic fluid i'm going to be using are gases now primarily the gas which we have around us is air and I wanted to show you a little demonstration here in which I shall try and float some soap bubbles on a layer of carbon dioxide. Before I do that, I'm just going to put aside my apparatus here. I'm going to put aside my apparatus here and I'm going to generate some carbon dioxide, which I'm going to feed into my bowl here. And I'm just putting, sorry, I'm just putting my piston over there. And what I wanted to say is this, this is a flask which contains marble chips. Marble chips, that's calcium carbonate. I will cover that, those chips with, carb, with um, hydrochloric acid and you'll notice effervescence. And one, and I will then put the pipe in here, the delivery tube, we will fill this up with carbon dioxide and then hopefully I'll be able to get some soap bubbles to float. And I will explain to you, using Archimedes' principle, the situation which ensues. Now, here is, oops, sorry, here is my hydrochloric acid. I have here some five molar hydrochloric acid, which is quite, quite a, a decent concentration. I pour in a small quantity into our flask here and I will then replace the bung. So there goes the acid, and I'm now putting my bung on tightly, and you can see now as I hold it up, you can see the effervescence in there. The carbon dioxide is being produced. The calcium carbonate, which is marble, is reacting with the hydrochloric acid to produce carbon dioxide um, water and calcium chloride solution. So that's the chemical reaction going on in there. And we're hopefully filling this with carbon dioxide, which is heavier than air. It has a higher density. It will displace the air from the bottom and push it out. Now, I've got no means of telling how much there is by looking at it, but we can tell with a simple test using a burning splint. So if I now take my burning splint and lower it in, this will give us an idea of where the carbon dioxide has got. You see the splint goes out. The reason why it's going out is because the bowl, the glass trough, is gradually filling with carbon dioxide. I'm just going to add a little, a little more. And when it's almost full, I'll try a very difficult experiment, and that is to float some soap bubbles on it. So let's just carry on. I think it's about as full as I'm going to get with this dose of acid. So we'll now move our flask to one side like this and blow bubbles. And there you see, there you can see in the trough are dancing. There is just one left, one bubble. Now, why is that bubble hovering above the bottom because the weight of the bubble, the down thrust of the bubble is being counteracted by the up thrust of the carbon dioxide which was able to support it. And that's why you see we were able to observe this phenomenon of the bubble, the bubbles floating on the layer of carbon dioxide because the down thrust of the bubble was counterbalanced by the up thrust, giving us what is known as a position of static equilibrium. The bubble was suspended while the carbon dioxide was. Now, if there's any carbon dioxide left, then we, it, we'll be able to use it and pour it over the flame and hopefully put the flame out but I'm not sure but we'll have a go and there you see the flame has been put out extinguished by carbon dioxide and now for, our, for my final demonstration on Archimedes principle involving once again displacement and uh, is going to and this and using compressible fluids, which are gases, I have in here a balloon which obviously is filled with a very light gas. The gas which is commonly used in children's balloons is helium, but this gas is the lightest gas in the universe. It is a 
bubbled hydrogen. Now, hydrogen was first made and identified by the great English chemist Henry Cavendish in 1766. And Cavendish made it, he called it inflammable air because this burns very effectively indeed. And when he made it by reacting acids such as sulfuric acid with iron or with zinc, this was a great, great sensation because not only did it burn very well and exploded with mixtures of air, but it also was lighter than air. It was capable of, if you filled something with it, and the methods for collecting gases have been developed towards the end of the 18th century, Cavendish was able to put hydrogen into a bladder. They used thin animal bladders and they connected them to strings. And this used to dazzle people. It was extraordinary to see. Now, why does it float upwards? Well, because air has a greater density than the density of hydrogen. It therefore provides an upthrust. And the, even though the rubber of the balloon is heavier than air, then it still goes upwards because the hydrogen is generating sufficient upthrust. Now, if I cut the string, then the balloon will simply, the equilibrium, the static equilibrium will be disturbed. Et voilà. And the balloon floats to the ceiling where it now won't go any further because, of course, it's come up against the ceiling. But here I've got something to show you, and this is where I'm going to uh, draw the demonstrations to a close, is a, again a balloon filled with hydrogen. But this balloon filled with hydrogen has got less hydrogen in it. And therefore, it is balanced at a much lower end. You see, the hydrogen in here, the balloon is being given up for us, but this string is acting as a weight is acting as a weight, and if I cut the weight off, then you will notice I'm just going to, I've got to do this at exact, because I'm going to try, uh, try and achieve something quite remarkable, which is to have a position of equilibrium where the balloon is exactly balanced in the air and not moving. So if I cut it here, let's just see, I'm going to cut it here initially, and what I need to do is to cut it and cut off enough string so that the balloon just about sits on the and, and maintains its position. Now, what we'll do is actually I can tie a little knot in here and then we can see the end of the string. I think that'll be more fun that way. And hopefully you'll see that it's not, nothing is being touched anywhere. It's still a tiny little bit there. Now, this way, what we're dem demonstrating here, and this is most important, is the phenomenon of buoyancy. When you have an upthrust, which is exactly counterbalanced by a downthrust, you have a, a position, what we say is buoyant. The balloon is buoyant at the moment. It is just, just a tiny bit touching this. The string is just a bit touching the table there. But I can, I think you can see the point I'm making. It really is buoyant. Now, buoyancy is a most important, has most important applications in the world today. There you see, it's, we're going to leave it there because it's, I think I've made the point quite clearly. Buoyancy is a phenomenon which has a huge application in three major situations. One is the design of submarines, another is the design of ships, and finally, the design of balloons which go up into the atmosphere. Now, I don't need to tell you, everyone knows that each of those three things has to exist in a stable situation in, um, in the environment in which it finds itself, either in water or the water-air interface or in surrounded by air. And what's interesting, of course, this is a different situation from the one I had here with carbon dioxide because there was a, a two gases, a denser gas and a lighter gas, here there is air only, so air is providing the upthrust on the balloon which is weighing downwards. I just wanted to show you the, the study of buoyancy is a very significant engineering problem and it's linked to the design of course of ships. Ships are made of steel, their density is considerably, steel has a considerably greater density than air, uh, than water, but the averaged out density, of course, is less than that of water. And there you see one of the important things that shipbuilders have to design is to make sure that the center of gravity is in a position in the ship 
to prevent it from pitching and rolling. Now, these are two very dangerous phenomena that can occur in ships. I'm sure you're all aware of that. But the point is, the lower the center of gravity, the greater the stability of the ship. But I'm not going to go into the detail. I've just simply mentioned for you some important ideas which are used in engineering using Archimedes' principle. Now, at this stage, uh, with our balloon in this position here, I'm going to just summarize very briefly the points which we have to make when we are talking about Archimedes' principles. So if someone says, what's relevant to Archimedes' principle? These are the things. Object immersed in a fluid. Up thrust from the fluid. Down thrust or weight from the object fluid displaced its volume and its weight and finally buoyancy oh and by the way 10 out of 10 if you spotted a deliberate mistake in my maths